Welcome back to the channel. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching Lawyer Up. Today we're going to be talking about self-defense and stand your ground laws. Now most people have heard about stand your ground laws, but they don't exactly know where that piece of the puzzle really fits into the overall picture. Uh, and most people haven't even heard of the duty to retreat. And I'm telling you, if you're going to stand your ground, you better know when you have the opposite duty, and that is to retreat or to skedaddle, or you could find yourself in a lot of hot water. So we're going to be talking about the law of self-defense in the United States today and more. If you learned something today, hit that like button. If you have a question or something to say, comment below, subscribe to the station, and as always, share me on social media. And remember, I am a lawyer, but I am not your lawyer. So if you need advice specific to your legal situation, you need to lawyer up with an attorney in your area. Now, any analysis of self-defense has to start with an examination of what you're defending yourself from. And generally, that's some sort of an assault or battery. Now, the traditional definition of each is as follows. An assault is the intentional and unjustified act that causes another to be apprehensive of imminent harmful or offensive contact. So the traditional definition of an assault is essentially a threat because you're causing somebody to be apprehensive about a harmful or offensive contact. For example, you could say, I want to kill you and point a gun at him. Well, if you don't pull the trigger, then essentially it's just a threat, but you're causing that person to be in apprehension of what might be forthcoming, which would be harmful or offensive contact. Now, a battery is the intentional and unjustified act that actually causes the contact. So with a battery, you have the actual physical contact. Now, of course, this has to be intentional. If you just bump into somebody on the subway and it's not intentional, that is not a battery. This is an intentional act where you slap or punch or kick somebody. That is the traditional definition of a battery. Now, today, a lot of states just combine all these acts under one statute and they call it assault. And they assign various degrees, first degree, second degree, third degree. Most states don't even use the term battery anymore. So when we're talking about in this video an assault, we're including all of those things, either a threat or a physical contact under one umbrella. Now the law protects people from these harmful or offensive contacts, these assaults. And because the law protects people from these assaults, you are allowed to defend yourself from being assaulted. And that is essentially the law of self-defense. So under the law of self-defense, you are allowed and legally justified to use reasonable force to repel an assault. Now, what is reasonable is pretty vague and it's meant to be. It's supposed to be fact dependent. So whatever situation that you're in, a judge or a jury can look at it and say, well, was that reasonable? Is that something a reasonable person would do in a same or similar circumstance? So that way, the standard can be applied to whatever factual scenario might come before the court. Let's talk about an example of an assault and an act of self-defense that might be reasonable. So you have person A, they're wearing their MAGA hat. And you have person B, and they're wearing their Black Lives Matters hat. And they're arguing with each other. And one of them decides that they're going to go and try to knock the hat off the other one. Well, that would be an offensive contact. That would be an assault. And the person who was trying to defend themselves, they would be justified in deflecting the arm. They'd be justified in catching it. Uh, they'd even be justified in shoving them away. Now, would they be justified in pulling out a gun and bam, killing them? Probably not. Well, definitely not, because that is not reasonable force. That doesn't give you the right to use deadly force in that situation because you're not facing uh, what would otherwise be death or serious bodily harm. And we'll talk about that more here in just a minute. So the thing to remember is that you're always justified in using reasonable force to protect yourself. Reasonable force. Now, it requires a special set of circumstances for that reasonable force to be elevated to your justification to use deadly force 
to protect yourself in a given situation. Now, deadly force under the law is defined as that degree of force that would be reasonably calculated to lead to death or serious bodily harm. We're talking about shooting somebody. We're talking about stabbing somebody. We're talking about hitting somebody in the head with a crowbar. This is deadly force. This is force that could lead to death or serious bodily harm. Now in the United States, you can only use deadly force when you yourself are facing a threat of death or serious bodily harm. And that is generally defined as either you or someone else, because you have the right to protect another, fears imminent death or serious bodily harm. So it has to be imminent or immediate coming your way. Now traditionally, under common law, and this goes back 200 years, there were two requirements before you could use deadly force. And the first one we just talked about, that a human being was facing death or serious bodily harm. Now notice I said a human being, because you cannot use deadly force to defend property. That is a no-no. And let me give you an example to illustrate what I mean by that. Let's say you're asleep in an apartment and you hear glass break out in the parking lot and you peer out the window and somebody's breaking into your vehicle. Well, you can't go and grab a gun and point it out the window and shoot the person because you can't use deadly force to defend property. You can't do that anywhere in the United States. That's illegal. Deadly force can only be used in the defense of life. Another popular example that illustrates this point is the spring gun scenario. And there are cases where people, uh, they have abandoned houses or rental houses that are empty uh, that are sometimes subject to vandalism. Uh, and uh, property owners want to stop that. And so some of them will rig a spring gun. And essentially what that is, it's a shotgun pointed at the front door. And they run some string around something and up into the door handle. And so when the door swings open with the would-be vandalizer, boom, the shotgun goes off. That's illegal. You can't use deadly force to protect property if there's nobody else in the dwelling. So those are two ways to illustrate the simple concept that deadly force is reserved for the protection of human life. Now the second concept, and remember we're talking still at common law about 200 years ago, is that before you could use deadly force, you had a duty to retreat. And that means a duty to skedaddle if you can, to get away from the situation, to uh, basically uh, leave, if you could do so safely, and that was always a caveat. If somebody's pointing a gun at you, you can't retreat safely. But if you can retreat safely, at common law, you had a duty to do so. So at common law, there were two things. One of them, you had to be facing death or serious bodily harm. And second, you had a duty to retreat if you could safely do so. And those were required before you could use deadly force. Well, as time went on and over the years, the uh, courts and lawmakers are like, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because there's certain places you shouldn't have to retreat from, namely your house. So in 1895, the United States Supreme Court adopted a phrase that they borrowed from England and a legal standard that they also borrowed. And the phrase was, an Englishman's man is his castle. The court adopted that phrase, they dropped English and said, a man's home is his castle. And essentially that is the castle doctrine. And that is you have no duty to retreat from your castle or your home. So in states that have adopted the castle doctrine, if someone breaks into your home, you have no duty to retreat before you can use deadly force. You can protect yourself, you can protect your family, and you have no duty to retreat within your own residence. Now, 49 of the 50 states have adopted the castle doctrine. The only state that doesn't have it is Vermont. And now Washington DC also has no castle doctrine. So those are the two areas where if a burglar breaks into your house, before you can use deadly force, you have to sneak out the back door. It just seems foreign to most people and kind of counterintuitive. But if you live in Vermont or in Washington DC, you have to retreat if you can do so safely before using deadly force even in your own home. Now other states thought the castle doctrine was a good idea, but it should be expanded even farther. They're saying, why should I have a duty to retreat at all? If I'm in a place where I'm legally entitled to be, why do I have to run off? Why can't I stand my ground? 
And that's where the new stand your ground laws come into play. What these laws state is that a person is entitled to stand their ground and they have no duty to retreat, no duty to run away before they use deadly force if they're in a place they're legally entitled to be. So that essentially extends the castle doctrine to anywhere. It could be a city park, could be the mall, could be on the side of the street, anywhere you're legally entitled to be. And 37 states have adopted these stand your ground laws. And probably the most popular case that characterizes uh, the stand your ground law is the tragic Trayvon Martin case out of Florida, where George Zimmerman, who was the head of the neighborhood security saw a suspicious character, somebody he thought was suspicious. It was Trayvon Martin who was actually staying with somebody within the gated community and was there legally. Well, George Zimmerman calls the police. He calls 911 and they actually told him not to approach. They would send somebody out to take a look at the situation, but for George Zimmerman not to approach the suspicious character. Well, he didn't listen. He approached and confronted Trayvon Martin, and we don't know exactly what happened. There was testimony at trial. We know at the end of it, George Zimmerman had a broken nose, the back of his head was bleeding, and Trayvon Martin was dead. George Zimmerman was charged with murder after that incident, but he raised as a defense that he had the right to stand his ground uh, when he was attacked, and the jury believed him, and ultimately he was found not guilty of that offense. Now that case happened in Georgia, and all the state's laws are a little bit different, but since we have a pretty good example that most people know about, I'm going to read to you the Florida Stand Your Ground statute so we can see how this concepts that we've talked about today actually play out in real life in statutory language. So we're gonna start with a statute that deals with deadly force, and I'm just gonna read this to you. This is the Florida statute on deadly force. It says, a person is justified in the use of deadly force and does not have a duty to retreat if he or she reasonably believes that such force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself or herself, or the person against whom the defensive force was used was in the process of unlawfully and forcefully entering or had unlawfully and forcibly entered a dwelling. So that's the castle doctrine. So that's Florida outlining that you have to be threatened with death or serious bodily harm and or if somebody's breaking into your house, you can use deadly force. But the statute goes on to state a person who is not engaged in an unlawful activity and who is attacked in any other place where he or she has the right to be has no duty to retreat and has the right to stand his ground and meet force with force, including a deadly force, if he or she reasonably believes it is necessary to prevent death or serious bodily harm. So right there is the stand your ground laws as it's stated in the Florida statutes. Now there is one caveat in this Florida statute that's interesting, it deals in the use of force by the aggressor. Now here's what it says. The justifications prescribed in the preceding sections that we just talked about are not applicable to a person who is number one, engaged in a criminal activity. So if you're engaged in a crime and something happens, you can't just pull out your gun and say, I'm standing on my ground and fire. If you're engaged in a criminal activity, you cannot use deadly force. And the second area is if that person initiates the problem. You can't provoke a fight. Uh, and then when the person responds to you, you say, well, I'm gonna stand my ground and shoot. So you can't be the initial aggressor in a situation and then rely on the stand your ground laws uh, to defend yourself. And most of us are familiar with the current case that deals with this topic, and that's the case in Georgia uh, involving the incident with Ahmad Arbery. And you've probably seen the video. He's running down the street uh, where he's confronted by two guys, one of which has a shotgun. Uh, somebody trailing the scene had a camera and is videotaping it, and you can't exactly see what happens at the end. Uh, but there's a confrontation. It looks as though Ahmad may reach for the gun, but ultimately he is shot and killed. And all three of the gentlemen that were involved in this situation have at this time been charged with murder. 
And I don't know what their defense ultimately will be when it gets to trial, but I bet it's going to be stand your ground. And the ultimate issue, if Georgia's laws are similar to Florida's, is that can they rely on stand your ground when they were the initial aggressor in that situation. They basically got in his way. They kind of stopped him. So being the initial aggressor, can then you rely on stand your ground? Well, in Florida, you can't. And we'll have to look more specifically at the laws of Georgia as this case moves forward, because it's gonna be a very interesting test of the stand your ground law. Well, that's the episode on stand your ground. I hope you uh, increased your knowledge of uh, stand your ground, the laws of assault and the laws of self-defense, when you can use deadly force, when you can't, because it's important to understand the ins and outs of the stand your ground laws. If you learned something today, hit that like button. If you wanna know more about the law, subscribe to the channel. If you got something to say, comment below. And as always, I love it when you share me on social media. Again, my name is Joshua Roberts, and you've been watching Lawyer Up. Send lawyers, guns, and money.